All right, let's say let's say this is possible. Let's say this is you know, this is feasible. How would I hide the world? Let's say I discovered it because you know, we didn't build it. It was built by, you know, someone or some group a lot more advanced than us, obviously. What do you mean? How, you, how would you hide the world? What is that well, mean? let's let's say you went out. Let's say this thing was as old, you know, very, very old and other civilizations have, have lived in it. But you wouldn't be able to, pr- to even detect it until you had advanced enough technology, most notably the internal combustion engine. And that wasn't even invented until, what, 1900? So... 1900 rolls around, then you can start creating aircraft, gasoline-powered aircraft, and then you could start looking for this thing. So be, uh, the, the thing I like to tell people is, like, look, let's say you were the king of France in 1600, and you had a map showing what the world really looked like. What good would it do? You've got wooden ships and horses. You're not going to be able to do anything. Even if you could get to Antarctica, which is an extremely unusual continent, uh, you you know, there's no animal life, no plant life. It's, it's the... Mm-hmm. the the sheer wall of ice that, that goes up 200 feet from the from the shoreline. Plus, they the do have they do have is, penguins there, right? The what? Well, at the, they do at have the penguins. Beach, sure. At, at the beach, there's penguins, but that's about it. And inland, there's okay. nothing. It is okay. it is a it, the place just screams go away. So let's say you did know about this. You didn't until you had internal combustion engines. You're not even going to come close to figuring out for sure where we are. And so that's when they took Admiral Byrd, the, the world's greatest uh, modern explorer, and the United States' uh, youngest admiral of all time. He, They put him in a plane and basically had him flying around Antarctica from 1928 all the way uh, up until 1956, looking for the edge, the the, the boundaries. I, I don't like to say edge because people say, well, if it's an edge, you'll fall off. The boundaries of this world, the fence line. The gun. Well, line. now that that's an assumption that that's what he was looking for, right? Because that well, it is, an, it is an assumption. But what happened after the last mission? It was everything pointed. Let's put it this way. Uh, yes, the clues that I made connected dots. That's all. That you know, I I like connecting dots and and making yeah. leaps of faith if I can. But what happened? After his last mission, which was in 1955, 1956, which was Operation Deep Freeze, once he got done with that mission, the world changed. All the governments, well, the governments, the relevant powers of the world acted very, very strangely. And, and that led into my, thi- my thing because it was, it was good timing because I said, all right, how would I hide the world? Meaning, let's say I found the border of the world and I didn't want people to go there. What would I do to protect it? And the first thing I, I would do is like, okay, I'd hide the upper edge and I'd hide the outer edge. It's easy enough to do. You just militarize space and most people don't have, you know, we don't have Jetsons cars, so nobody's going up high enough mm-hmm. because it's, it's way higher than commercial traffic or even spy, spy plane uh, altitudes. So you militarize space and NASA is a military organization. Don't think for a second that it isn't. It is DOD founded on the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. Uh, Werner von Braun is is the father of, of, of NASA, and he was one of Nazi Germany's most uh, decorated scientists. So NASA was started as one of the uh, results of Operation Paperclip, is that right? Yes. Well, yes. Yes. So, well, yeah. The scientists they brought back, that NASA was more founded, though, because of the atomic weapons testing, otherwise known as Operation Fishbowl, which is an interesting name, where, Mm -hmm. for whatever reason, after Admiral Byrd got back from Operation Deep Freeze, they started, the Soviet Union and the United States started firing nuclear weapons up straight up for four years. That's all they did was fire nuclear weapons, just fire, you know, big ones in the beginning, you know, megatons, back when megatons were very, very pricey. Yeah, everybody assumes that that testing was to make sure they could blow up the world. Yeah. Right. And each but, other but and everybody from, else. from our standpoint, it was, no, they were, they were mapping out the sky. But first it was like, okay, well, can we bust through this thing? And, you know, can we, can we bust through the, the barrier that's, that's above us, the, the dome? And after that, they, once, they, once they figured out they couldn't, they just started using kiloton weapons to just figure out, okay, what, is the, what are the exact dimensions of this thing? What's the curvature of it? Uh, the arcs, anyway. And at the same time, what was interesting, what, here, here were the big ones. The big ones, 
changes that happened were in 1959, where in 1959, two very important things happened. One was the Van Allen radiation belts were announced by Van Allen, a NASA employee, go figure, and the Antarctic Treaty was signed. And the Antarctic Treaty, you cannot underestimate this thing. And then please look it up if you get a chance. None of the stuff I'm telling you, by the way, is secret information. You can look, you can look it up and, and, and see the, the, the broad moves that were made yourself. The Antarctic Treaty was put in place in 1959, same year as the Van Allen radiation belts. Van Allen belts basically saying, don't go up there. There's something super, super deadly. And if any humans go past it, they're going to die. And Which, what altitude was that supposed to be at when it was in? Uh, that Ellen Reedy Bell should totally start, I think, about 500 miles, okay. give or take, and, and this extend upwards of 60,000 miles deep, some, some to that effect. Okay. And, but, but we'll get into that in a second. The second part was the Antarctic Treaty, which says, and I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating when I say this, that no corporation anywhere in the world can do anything in Antarctica ever. That's, that's the short version of it. So if you all of a sudden, uh, Richard, decide to create your own country and you become an economic power, you will have to sign this treaty. And the treaty says none of your corporations can go down to Antarctica ever. The treaties, it's the only treaty ever in the history of treaties that, that has gone this long without anybody even challenging it. So and there it's were like even, 150 countries that signed it or something like every, that? Everybody signs it. If you, if you trade... In the world, you have to sign this country. And it's not even up for debate until the year 2041. And, it, 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 and you know full well, the, and, and here's where it gets weird. Richard Byrd, the, the world's you know, greatest explorer, he got, went on national television and, and said in 1954, and this is when I think they were almost ready to give up, and that's Murphy's Law for you. And it's like, ah, the world's not flat, apparently. Let's just... Let's just carve, carve Antarctica up and, and, and go after resources. He said, look, there's an entire mountain range made out of coal that can supply the entire world. There's oil, there's minerals, there's uranium. Let's just make money. In fact, he was worried that... I, I saw the black and white video of that interview, yeah. Yeah, it was a brilliant video. It was on a, a show called The Long Jeans Chronoscope back in 1954. It was kind of like a 60 minutes of, the, of, of their time. Right. Uh, it was a watch company. That's why they called it The Long yeah, Jeans yeah, Chronoscope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Well, and yet, no cor- like no oil company. Here's here's what gets even weirder. Not only are, are no corporations allowed to go down there, no corporations are even allowed to talk about going down there, even suggesting it. I mean, if I'm the head of Exxon, I'm going to go to the New York Times and I'm going to run a full page ad every month saying how great it would be for Exxon to go to Antarctica. I'm going to grease the palms of every politician I can. I'm going to hire the best lobbyists, and I'm going to go down there. And we all know this. I mean, I mean, look at the fracking in the United States. You can, if somebody wants to frack in your backyard, they can start pretty much next week. It's only a question of who they're going to get to. If they get mm-hmm. to your neighbors, if they get to the local politicians, they can. They're gonna, you know, the only, the only place they're not fracking right now are places where there's no, where there's no resources to frack. So you're telling me these companies can't go to Antarctica, can't even talk about going to Antarctica? It's it go it's completely goes against what we are as a civilization that runs so, on. So freedom. what happens when you start asking official people why that's the case? It never happens. Well, I can tell you what happens behind closed doors. That it's because I know what I would do, and that is if a major oil company was even considering it, you monitor the email traffic and tap phones and whatever you need. And if anyone even starts thinking about going down that that path, you go to the highest level of the exec of that company or the board, and you say it's a matter of national security. It's you're not allowed to even talk about it, and if you even think about going against us, we will stop you with a, a federal injunction. Has anybody from the public ever? Pr- investigated and, uh, and started asking these guys what the official answer is well they've tried nobody nobody there's no responses from anybody nobody you can never you will not find out it you basically get dial tones you don't get anything from from inquiring there's nobody okay. there's so no if you there's figure no out what to, department to, it is within the u.s government at the federal level for example that's in charge of uh I don't know, whatever. Would well, well that's, just, that. that's, that's where it gets even, 
again, the lines get so blurry because nobody own. Here's where it gets even weirder. It's it's fragmented to the point where even if you went to one government, they would just shuffle shuffle you off to a different one. Nobody owns Antarctica. So no That's one officially is right. even in charge, right? No, nobody's even in charge of Antarctica. And that part alone, which I, I talked about in the clues, which was, do you know a single piece of real estate anywhere, anywhere ever that isn't owned by somebody? You know, yeah, they're, it, all, it, they're all owned. They're I all mean, owned. If it's not owned by... If you look by, at the mil- middle of the wilderness in the U.S., it's either owned, supposedly, even if it's illegally, it's owned by the government. Exactly. Or it's, if it's, or it's owned if, by the state or it's owned by some rancher or something. Exactly. exactly. It's either private or state or federal. Somebody yeah. owns whatever it is, but when it comes to Antarctica, nobody owns anything. So, so is, this, is this treaty something that can be looked at? Sure. Sure, you can look it up. It's, it's it, right there it online. Under, under the um, jurisdiction of the UN or something like that, or is it supposedly just they all spontaneously just signed it? Exactly. No that's, that's what it is. No, it's not UN sanctioned or anything like that. Now, of course, there's other secondary environmental treaties which have been put in place after the fact. But in 59, why in the world would, especially when there's countries that are rebuilding from World War II, like the Soviet Union? Uh-huh. I mean, there were, there were something like a dozen countries down there in the 50s. There was uh, Soviet Union, Great Britain, Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, Australia, United States, so on and so on. But once Operation Deep Freeze concluded, everybody left. And the only people that was, are down was with Bird exploring it, you mean? Yeah, when Bird was exploring it in 1955-56. And what oh. I believe happened, my leap of faith anyway, is that after pushed the better part of 30 years of flying, because he flew his own planes, and planes got way better in the 1950s, that he figured out where the, the outer boundary was. And it was probably thousands of miles past the coastline. It's not like... The end of the earth is, is, you know, at the Antarctic coastline. You have to go thousands of miles. But the decision was made, and I don't blame them. I, I totally get it, which is, all right, we can't let corporations down here because sooner or later they're going to, you know, it, it, all it takes is one rogue plane or rogue helicopter. Somebody goes off course. They see the wrong thing. Then what are you going to do? Yeah, you know, you're going to have to take care of them. You're going to swear them to silence or you're just going to kill them. How many people can you actually kill? So they, they decide, okay, you know what? Let's just make it a, an all or nothing deal. Nobody gets to go down here. And that way we don't ever have to worry about, you know, we'll just say you know, now we'll put it under the cover of multiple treaties. But the Antarctic Treaty was the biggest one. And now they'll say, well, it's for science. You know, it's a scientific thing. And you don't want to go down here anyway and blah, blah, blah. And, and now, well, now it's, haven't there been some scientific expeditions to parts of it measuring temperatures and oh sure things and stuff like that? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, there's research bases down there, and if you want, and and don't get me wrong, when you because know, some people will say, well, no, no, I can book a trip to Antarctica. But yeah, fine. You want to spend what fifteen grand, ten, ten, fifteen thousand? I think it'll do it. You can go down to the peninsula and have your picture taken with penguins and all that fun stuff, right. but. When it, but as far as going on in the interior, you cannot go down there and unload your own helicopter and just take off. You, they can't, will, go, you, you can't go inland. No. Well, again, they have, they have to be clever. They have to, they're not going to put up signs saying that you can't go in. They'll say you need permits. And you need permits from multiple countries because no one country owns Antarctica. And so they put enough red tape in your way. To where even if you could, even, and let's put those, let's say you jump through all those hoops, eventually, then they'll just monitor you. And, and they'll figure out where you're going, and if they have to sabotage you, they will. But again, the, the continent is so hostile to us as far as uh, the, just the temperature and, and, just, it's, it's all, and the altitude. Remember, the, most of the continent is sitting above 14,000 feet. And altitude yeah, sickness kicks in at about seven thousand feet, so it's not yeah. it's not fun no matter what. Yeah, and and it, so far it has worked really really well. Antarctica has been uh, a great no go zone, and and really, I don't know. I've I've known people that have traveled my whole life. Nobody goes to Antarctica. So how did the research teams go in there? Oh, the military military puts them in, and the bases are there, but most of them are within striking distance of the coastline. There are a few bases somewhat, and, and if you want, you can pay a little extra, and they will take you to what they say the South Pole is. But remember, the GPS well, system, and, and people will also say the GPS system proves the Earth is a globe. I'm going, well, okay, 
remember the GPS, which also stands for Global Positioning System, is also a DOD project. It's the American, you know, the Americans came up with it in the 90s. There's supposedly blanket coverage of 30 satellites that are supposedly revolving around that track, mm-hmm. you track everything. So what Sorry. would be required to change it from that last part where you said, all right, based on this much that we know, my leap of faith is this is all the reasoning for it. What would be required to change that from your leap of faith to proving that it's right? <sighs> proving the flat earth at this point? There's, there's a proof Yeah, via, you- via Antarctica. Okay, if you want to prove Antarctica out, here's, the, here's how I would do it. You could do it with, well, you do it the slow way with two ships, but all you need is one ship and one plane. You, and you, you, you probably figure out what I'm doing here as I, as I describe it, which is you take, if, if the world is like a clock, if it's a flat circular clock, mm-hmm. you put the ship in the six o'clock position and you take a plane with a lot of fuel on it and you either have it go clockwise or counterclockwise, always within visual distance of the Antarctic coastline because you can't trust GPS. GPS uh, will will not just show you but it will show you where you it wants you to think you are. So you try the, to fly around Antarctica visually, right? Yeah, basically you have to fly around Antarctica visually and you either will run into the ship. If you could run into the ship because remember, if you believe in mainstream science that Antarctica is only about the same island continent size of say Australia. In right. fact, it's weird, yeah. and, and but and which means you could, should be able to circle it in a in a decent plane in eighteen hours, maybe, okay. which isn't that which isn't that bad. So the ship but could just it, stand in one place and wait for you to come back, right? Exactly, exactly. But if it wasn't, that plane would have to refuel long before you even got close. Which it and couldn't do, and that would be a way to, to refuel from it. Right? Yeah, plane. that that would yeah. Otherwise, yeah, you'd have to ditch and refuel somewhere, but. Here's the problem. Yeah. The Antarctic Treaty, which has been expanded, in fact, just recently, you can't get a ship even – the Antarctic Defense Force will uh, basically escort you out. You can't even be within not just visual distance. It, it's, I think it's below the 60th parallel. You can't you, – the, the, the test 60th, is really that's a be impossible. Way away. You'd think it, it'd be an innocent enough test to do. Of course, it would take some money to do because you'd need a big enough well, plane. Well, yeah, but somebody, somebody curious would fund that, I would think. You'd think, but to date, nobody, uh, nobody stepped forward yet. But that would be a way to prove it with Antarctica, if you wanted to. And yeah. because that is, Antarctica is the only continent that doesn't look anything like the maps. Everything else right. looks actually fairly similar. Yeah, yeah oh. I mean, you fly around that, and the whole thing is over, right? Yeah, if because you can fly around it and do it in a in very, a very short amount of time. time or, or it's going to take you weeks or something, and you're never going to Well, make it. it wouldn't take you weeks, but it would definitely... But let's put it, you, there is no plane in existence that has enough fuel to pull that off. Yeah, you'd have to figure out the refueling question, for sure. Yeah. And, and by the way, you know, I know some people are having a hard time visualizing this, have never heard about it for the first time. If you want to know what the continent layout looks like on the flat Earth, you're basically looking at the UN flag. Right. Right. Which is, again, which was interesting. And I don't know, I don't think I told this story in the clues. That was one of the things that got me hooked was when that Canadian artist was talking about this party out in, that he was out to in um, uh, the United States when he was a, a contractor for NASA doing, doing painting work. He was a painter, photorealistic realistic painter that they would do for mission simulations. Nothing sinister. Okay. And the guy was – basically he was saying that uh, there was some guy that, that – be- all these people in the room commanded different teams. And one of them said, hey, you know, I heard a rumor that uh, the GPS doesn't work out in Antarctica. And another guy said, hey, Fred, you better send one of your, one of your groups out there to confirm that. Another guy chimes in and goes, well, if, if he sends the guys out that far, they're not coming back. And, and, and my, the, the guy in our community goes, well, wait, why, why are they coming back? He goes, well, because GPS doesn't work out there. And he goes, why doesn't it work out there? Because it's flat. And, of course, when you hear this for the first time, you don't get it. Nobody gets this the first time. And the guy then took a piece of chalk, and he started drawing this big, on, on the cement floor below these guys, what the world looked like. And basically, the, the, the story goes that when he was done, 
the artist was looking down. He goes, he goes, I was basically looking at the UN flag. The UN yeah. flag is the model that we're working on right now is, is you know, we're, we're the North Pole is the center of the circle and then all the continents are splayed outward. But what what's interesting is... What do you call that projection, is, by the way? It's called, yeah, the projection is called, you can look it up on, in Wiki, it's called the Azimuthal, A-Z-I-M-U-T-H-A-L, equidistant map. Okay. And what's very, very interesting about the UN flag is that Antarctica isn't on there. Which is interesting, because there's all sorts of different projections where Antarctica is on there. But on the Azimuthal map, the, the, the official Azimuthal map, Antarctica is just this giant ring around the outside, but it was left out on the UN flag. Which is, you know, are you saying why? the ring out of sight, even, out of mind? If if you don't see it, the ring isn't even there on the fl- on the UN flag. What Antarctica? Yeah. No, it's not there. It is is literally not there. In fact, instead uh, of Antarctica, on the UN flag, you have these two wreaths. These are kind of Greco-Roman yeah, wreaths yeah. on the outside. And yeah. I'm going, okay, does that represent Antarctica, or does that represent a barrier? What in the world are we looking at here? It's, uh, but it's, it's interesting that it's, it's just a nice picture. I mean, most yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so people have, have flown like around the world going on a line of latitude, for example, or the equator or something. Yeah. And that works okay. And it, and it comes out to be, well, actually, you know what? If they flew around the world latitude wise, meaning east to west or the other way, yeah. on like the Tropic of Capricorn. Yep. That would also prove that the globe model is true or false, because the distance to do that would be radically different according to which model is correct. That is true. You're absolutely right. If somebody flew... You're allowed to fly at the Tropic of Capricorn, right? I'm sorry, say it again? You are allowed to fly a plane... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're abs- and, and somebody has suggested that recently where you could... In fact, you wouldn't even have to use Capricorn in Cancer. You could say... Uh, you know, well, I don't know how many degrees above or below the equator. Yeah, just just a little bit. But well, above sh- the no, above the equator would not prove anything. Well, but if you but both if you did both, are pretty close. But if you did both, you could compare. Yeah, the, two. the, the key is to do it below the equator. Yeah, but yeah, what just occurred to me is you don't have to worry about breaking into Antarctica if you just go a little bit below the equator and you know how to use math. You know yeah. whether the model is correct or not. Yeah, which also, by the way, here's another interesting, and there's so many interesting points, I know we don't have time, but here's here's a couple other things. There was a YouTuber, not a flat earther, because some people say, well, you know, the toilets and the and the sinks, they drain differently, clockwise versus counterclockwise, yeah, or, or, yeah. or the southern hemisphere. And there was a really big YouTuber out there, he's, again, not a flat earther, and it's called Smarter Every Day. And he wanted to prove it. He called it the swirling toilet experiment or something to that effect. Uh-huh. But he didn't use toilets. But what he did was, it was one of the finest scientific tests I've ever seen for this. Which was he took, a, he did a simulcast. One guy was in the far south. One guy was in the far north. Okay. They built identical kids' waiting pools with a central drain. Okay. You know, a tubular drain in the top. Made sure that they they waited to for hours for the water to be perfectly calm. No turbulence and, and, to throw it off or anything. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And then put instead of even putting little little floaty things, they put eye, they used eye droppers and did food coloring in sort of a cr- in cross patterns in the pool, okay. and then pulled the plugs in the exact same time. I mean, they were literally talking to the phone on the phones with each other, so you couldn't say, yeah. well, it was one day versus another day. Yeah. And. I'll be darned if the drains, it was so unbelievably slight, meaning clockwise versus counterclockwise, the, the guy, and he's not necessarily a debunker, this guy, he, was, he said, look, I don't know what you're, you know, whatever you're seeing as far as toilets flushing and drains, it's got to be the direction of the, of, the, of the flow itself, meaning how the water is going into the bowl or the sink, because we cannot detect, or, I mean, it's so minute that it's uh, that it's all that, that it's just not there. So are you know, they saying it did not spiral? It just went straight toward the center, or what? Well, no, no, it spiraled, but it was it took almost forever. It was so gradual that it didn't mimic at all what they were expecting. They were expecting you know obvious swirl patterns, right, right, and and it and it didn't happen. And yet, did they we go are in taught, opposite directions? Yeah, it was it was in opposite directions, but it wasn't enough to. But to be conclusive, you know, it really surprised him. It wasn't enough to definitely, let's put it this way, 
uh, wasn't enough to affect anything else that he could think of. And let me let me segue that into because I, again, I know there's so much I could cover. I could talk about this for weeks. Which is the uh, some of the subject matter experts. I, I got to get into this because this wasn't in the clues. Which was when I when I put these clues out. Not only did I not have scientists coming against me, but I had subject matter matter experts that were giving me testimonials in favor of flat Earth. Meaning guys that were in the in the military from all branches: Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Merchant Marines, structural engineers. Air traffic controllers, pilots, all sorts of different pilots. But what was interesting to me were the guys that fired weapons, meaning the guys, not not just the, uh, yeah, I had a Marine sniper that, that wrote and said, look, I, he goes, I, because we've all heard that, for example, because ex- your people will, will, will think about this, will say, well, no, you know, a sniper has to account for the spinning of the earth when they take a shot, otherwise known as the Coriolis effect. Mm-hmm. And... The Marine sniper said, no, it's not even in the manual. We don't, you know, I've taught, I've taught sniper school for three years. We don't even, we don't think of it. And that's just a mile. I've talked to tank commanders, artillery guys. Uh, one of my favorite was the, uh, uh, the missile commander from the United States Navy. He, he was a, a Sea Sparrow missile instructor for 10 years. And he goes, look, the firing solution, he goes, not only, to, to, he killed two birds with one stone here. One, he goes, look, we're using a two-inch two inch pencil beam radar, and we're going point to point over 60 miles. We need that radar to be spot on. Basically, they're painting the target at 60 miles. He goes, 60 miles? He goes, how in the world are we hitting that thing with the curvature? You can't tell me that gravity is bending that laser perfectly at 60 miles to where we can hit the target. Two, we're not using the spinning of the Earth, otherwise known as the Coriolis effect, in any of the firing solutions. And and all the other military guys that came on all talked about this. They said the spinning of the Earth, we've all heard of it, but it's never, ever used in our nine-to-five jobs. Meaning, think about it, if you're an artillery guy shooting a cannon, think of how many more calculations, you, you've seen war movies, how many more calculations you would have to do. Because not only do you have to come up with windage and elevation, but now you've also got to figure out, if you're shooting 30 miles with a cannon, you've got to figure out, okay, wh- which way are we facing, north, south, east, west, that has a bearing on it, and what part of the globe you're on would also mm-hmm. have a bearing on your firing solution. Because... The, the again, well, I, I know I'm kind of go off on tangents, but if the earth, if you believe in mainstream science, the earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour at the equator, mm-hmm. but it's also spinning at zero miles an hour at the North Pole, at the poles, right? And which right. means you know, if, if you it, it gets faster as you're as you're moving south right. until you get to the equator. So, why, why are nobody taking into the account these firing solutions, even though mainstream will say, well, a sniper shooting at one mile had to come up, we had to account for the curvature. Or the uh, the spinning of the earth? Yeah. No, he didn't, because we're shooting. So you no. said all these people came on and talked about it. Came on what? What? What was? The oh, venue? I'm sorry. Came on. I, I ended up getting a podcast out of it, a radio show. Oh, uh, okay. Somebody heard me doing a um, uh, an interview for another station, and they said, "Hey, how would you like to have your own show?" And I go, "Okay, fine. I'm just going to talk about flat Earth every week." And I yeah. sh- I'm I just finished my 94th episode. Okay, and. It, all these guys kept saying the same thing, which was we all heard about the the, the Coriolis effect and the curvature, but we never use it. The uh, the planar surveyor. Most people don't know there's two types of surveyors in the world. There's not, but 99 percent of them, on 95, 96, are planar surveyors. Literally, the, they they treat the world literally. You can look up them in the manual, like you treat every project that like the world is perfectly flat. And this one surveyor, he'd been doing it for 30 years, and he goes, you know what? Even by accident, somebody, some surveyor, because he was working on big projects, 10, 20 miles square, somebody has to take into account the curvature of the earth. You can't tell me that north, south, east, or west, the projects that butt up against mine, somebody's going to be out of alignment because they didn't take into account the curvature of the earth. But but they don't. They, they're all told, just don't worry about it. Don't you worry about the curvature. Basically, square properties don't fit on a curve. On a, on a ball. It's like covering a basketball with wheat thins. Eventually, you're going to run into gaps. It's going yeah, to happen. Yeah, yeah. And, well, they and, all, and with, and with the, the calculations for shooting a, a rifle or a missile or something, it seems to me if the globe model is correct, then if you're shooting directly east or west, then there's nothing to worry about. 
but if you're shooting north or south or any oh, variable, north, northwest, southeast, oh yeah, you'd yeah. have to take that into account. It, you, they, you'd have to shoot directly east or west not to care about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and it never ever happens. I mean, uh, look, I I'm, I shoot. I, I can tell you right now. Uh, and granted, uh, you know, I, the the rifles I have don't reach out a mile. But scopes, I don't care what scope you're using, they only have two settings on it. One's for windage, one's for elevation. That's uh-huh. that's that's all anyone cares about. Um, Tell people what windage is. Oh, windage. Uh, sorry. Uh, how, which, the, the wind's blowing in a certain direction over a distance, that wind is going to affect the bullet. It's going to blow it kind of like a car on a highway. Yeah, it's going to blow gonna it. Like end up 10 feet to the left because the wind and, is blowing from your right. Exactly. Basically, you don't ever want to shoot in high winds if you can help it, because you, it'd be like, it, yeah, it's going to blow it. Yeah, it's going to blow it off course. Uh, right. Here's another thing: if you're, we all know that water it reacts very quickly to momentum changes. You know, you you're, you're driving, you have a cup of coffee in your hand, you don't want to make a sharp left hand or a turn because your your coffee is going to spill. Right. So, how is it that the water on our world, let's say it is a globe? How the water is uniformly holding on to the globe, even though it's spinning like a merry-go-round at the center at a thousand miles an hour. You say, "Well, a thousand miles an hour, yeah, but it's taking twenty-four hours." I'm going, "I don't care. It's a lot of water. You can't tell me that centrifugal force is being completely nullified by gravity. You can't tell me that." There, sh- I'm that, not saying that is what you're being told, though. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's exactly what we're being told. We're we're and and because I'm saying when there's no wind. Even though you're spinning at a thousand miles an hour, the water doesn't show it. No, the water doesn't show any bulges. And I know science is going to say, well, no, there's like a 500 mile bulge of water at the equator. I'm going, really? 500 miles or 500 feet or whatever it is? It, there's nothing there. And not only that, it, the, you're telling me the water is completely uniform at the north and south poles. There should be bald spots. I'm not saying the water is going to be spiraling around us like Saturn's rings, but the, it's certainly not going to be completely perfectly uniform. Yeah, it's just, if you're moving well. Now, there's another issue here too, because if you're moving at a thousand miles an hour in one steady direction with your coffee cup full, yeah, yeah. and you don't change speed, it's not going to spill. Right. It's acceleration and deceleration that make it turbulent. Oh no, no, you're, you're absolutely right. But but the water. But my point was is that water is susceptible to motion. Meaning, right? But but how susceptible is it to steady, unchanging speed? That's what oh, I'm it's no, no, no! It's still going to be affected because remember, uh, use the merry-go-round uh, uh, observation, which is oh, I got to hang up on that for now. The um, it, it's the merry-go-round observation, which is even if it's a, even if, even if the merry-go-round is unchanging in its speed, the water is still going to be pulled towards the edge of the merry-go-round because that's where the because it's not moving in a straight line. In other words, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an so, angular momentum involved. Exactly. So okay. the the water in the se- you cannot the water and I know the the merry go round is an interesting example because it's not a sphere, but it, but at least you you get the point. Which is you put water in a merry go round and spin that merry go round. It doesn't matter, matter if you even start spinning it slowly or super slowly. Eventually, the centrifugal force of the merry go round is going to pull that water. It's going to pull to the outside. So they're postulating that gravity does totally overcome that. Yeah. They're, they they say that gravity completely overcomes that. I'm going really completely overcomes that. Uh, it's a stretch. It really. I'm sorry. It's you can't tell well, me if that gravity didn't. If gravity didn't overcome it, any spinning planet would lose all its water really very quickly. Right. Yeah. So they have to assume that gravity is strong enough to take care of that, and it's not the kind of thing that's really easy to test. No. No, and here's and and here's you know I again I I I I'm sure you've got a few more points you got to make, but yeah. the, I'm I'm trying to th- think of arguments that have been thrown at me over the last few months, which is some people that one of their first knee jerk reactions is well we can see in the sky that all the other planets are spheres, therefore we have to be a sphere, and I come back and I go who told you they were spheres. You know, how do you know exactly that there's spheres? You know, when, when, when I look up there, I see lights. And if I have binoculars, yeah, I see a circular light. But the only three-dimensional flybys you ever hear from are from NASA. Well, you, would have, you would have to be able to beam, say, a, a beam of light at a planet in the center and at the edge and show that there's a difference in depth. 
Yeah, but even then, uh, again, when because people will also say, well, how do you get the uh, the uh, the spherical kind of shadows on the moon, the waxing and waning crescents, and the blood moon, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'm going. I'm going. Look, we can do this now. And I know I'm dated when I say that. Uh, when I go to a planetarium, when you go to a planetarium, you know Neil deGrasse Tyson runs the Hayden Planetarium. Yeah. We can simulate all these things right now. And I know people don't want to. You know, it's too big for some people to even think about. It's like who says that when you walk out of that planetarium, you're just not in a bigger planetarium. Because I've had amateur astronomers come at me and say, look, I've seen the moons of Jupiter through my telescope. I'm going, that's awesome. That's great. Take that telescope, go to the planetarium. Does, does it look more or less spherical? And they say, and they say, well, it doesn't matter because I'm in a planetarium. I'm looking at an image. I'm going, how do you know you're not looking at an image now? How do yeah. you know? It's and, very hard to tell if what you're seeing is two or three dimensional. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, unless it's really close to you because then your eyes have enough of an angle so you get some depth perception. And people will also use the the sticks and shadows argument. So they'll say, well, this was proven a long time ago. And I'm going, well, you made some assumptions, though, about how big the sun was. You know, the the sun was you know, 93 million miles away and, and yeah. hundreds of thousands of miles wide. The sticks and shadows argument also works the same if the sun is really close and not very big. You know, it's it's perspective. We are, are notoriously yeah, yeah, bad yeah, yeah. at it. So what we're because people say, well, what about the sun and the moon? I'm saying the sun and the moon are just mobiles above a child's crib. In this case, they're they're, it's, they're very. It's a similar thing to when people report seeing a UFO, because it could either be, you know, hundreds of miles long and a thousand miles up in the sky, or it could be a hundred yards over their head and just look the same size. Oh right, right, right. It's, oh yeah, it's the human, same visual image. Human beings are notorious bad at, at perspective and we're even worse at um, relative motion the the argument which i used in one of my cl- later clues just to give people uh, a, a different take was that you, we've all been in stop and go traffic where we zone out for a second and then all of a sudden you don't know if the car next to you is moving or if you let off the brake you you get this yeah, weird i had that experience in a train you there know, you, go. you go yeah you go into a place where you're all stopped next to each other and then somebody starts moving Yep. And you really cannot tell whether it's you or the train next to you. No, you don't know. And we're genetically disposed to that, meaning it seems like we were kind of built to be f- deceived in this way because they, there was a university study where they, they put people in fake you know, wooden cars and, and sometimes they would move the car and sometimes they would move the wall in front of them. Uh-huh. People could uh-huh. not tell, could not well, tell, which is why simulators work so well, it's, which is why some people right. cannot watch even – a low res video of a roller coaster on a television because they'll get sick. Yeah. He's yeah, like, look, exactly. there is no roller well, coaster. And they, it's like, the I other can't thing think. that's interesting to consider in the whole mix is that who is really moving is a totally meaningless question that can never be answered right. because the, the meaning of movement is always relative to what something right. else. Right. Yeah. And it's not saying point A is moving and point B is stationary. That's completely arbitrary. Right. And so when we look up at the sky now, again, once you get into the community, you realize that, uh, oh, well, you know, all right, let me throw one more big one out at you and then you can, you can, you can fire away wherever you yeah, want. Yeah, but what's yeah. the, when it comes, are we moving or the stars moving? And what's right. interesting is, is there's also something that's missing up in the sky and that is uh, parallax. And people are going, okay, what's parallax? Parallax is when, a uh, uh, perfect example is if you're driving down the road, the telephone poles are going by, you know, pretty quick off, off the side windows. But right. when you look out in the distance, the mountains are going by quite a bit slower. And that is because the telephone poles are very close. The mountains are farther away. Yeah. Well, here's the problem with that when it comes to space. You've got the, the closest star is apparently something like four light years away. And there are some stars out there that they say are thousands, if not millions of light years away. Right. But yet when we do time lapse of the stars, they're always rotating in the exact same fashion. They're never, there's never any deviation. They're perfectly, they're perfectly lined up. There's these perfectly patterned circles. And the science will say, no, well, you can't tell in, in just a night or even a week or a month. I'm just going because they said the distances are too great and we can't tell. Well, isn't that because they say the stars aren't moving with relation to each other? Basically, they're, they're saying that, that we cannot detect. They're saying the stars are going all over the place, 
but we can't detect them because the distances are so vast that we we can't tell them in a short time. I'm going, well, okay, that's fine, but then you're also saying that uh, because the constellations, which we you know all have known, you know Leo and Cancer and Virgo, and they're staying the same for long periods. Right? They stay. They the, the the constellations haven't changed in thousands of years. So yeah. when exactly would we see the parallax? When would we see the stars doing these weird formations that never ever happen? It's just things that people don't think about. And again, it's things that every little thing that I've mentioned here during the show, they all point back to the same. For, for at least in our community, the same conclusion. And that is, at the very least, you are not on a globe. We're not, we're, we're, can we say exactly what the shape is, what the arc is, and, and how flat it is, and what the shape of the dome is? No, no, we can't. But what the very least we can tell you, 100%, everyone will say the same thing in the community, is we know you're not on a globe anymore. And the, 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 the powers that be figured it out in the 1950s, for sure. I think they suspected for a long time before that. And they they tried to hide it from you, and the, it worked. It worked really, really well. But the internet detection ability got better. You know, the the access that people had to their homes, the the all the the information that are on the clouds out there, people sharing sharing things. It only takes you know one guy in the middle of the night to find a, a frame that's out of place, and then he puts it out there. And the the cumulative effect is nobody's buying it anymore. So, all right. so what I would like to encourage listeners to do is. Get out of the paradigm of saying, I believe this or I don't believe that, because that's the lazy way. Yeah. I want people to use your brilliant creativity and think of how do you prove that this whole idea is right or wrong? And, and, then, and I really want people to think about that because it can expand your, your mind and the way you're thinking. And the other, the other two things I want to bring up quickly is that... That, because you mentioned these in the clues, and I thought they were really interesting. Thank you. Um, the the first one about the um, forbidden nature of Antarctica that just occurred to me while we were talking. Mm-hmm. Um, if the flat Earth model is correct, then the Antarctic coast, the edge there of the, of the continent, yep. is really long. I don't yep. know how many miles it is, but you must. Oh, I mean, it'd, it'd be it'd be huge. It'd be tens of thousands of miles, fifty thousand or more miles right. long. So, how are they managing to keep all curious explorers away from that entire long edge? Gotcha. Oh, are you, are you first, asking me? Yeah, I'm asking. Oh, oh, the uh, the the treaty for the most part. The the treaty. So nobody's and, really trying to to sneak through where it's not guarded or something. No, like that. but but also you got to remember that this place was built with some really clever natural re- um, negative reinforcements. So that, I mean, the Antarctica, really, you don't want to... It's not a comfortable weekend trip. No! No, I mean, if, uh, honestly, if you're in a boat, uh, you know, once you start seeing your first I- icebergs, you, you don't want to go there. And then yeah, if you those do, are dangerous. Huh? If you do get to the coastline, it's a 200-foot wall of ice going straight up. You get on top of that, and there's nothing, you know, there's no land markers. You're just on top of ice and snow. Yeah. Then the It'd altitude starts... And, and even compasses probably wouldn't work either. No, no, that's Although all another how thing. how they behave is an interesting subject in itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that the North Pole seems to be the only magnetic force. And, and in fact, I had a military guy from Australia say that there is no magnetic south that he, they could ever determine. Okay, so. well, anyway, that's one issue. The other one is um, I thought you had a really interesting point, of just a question for listeners to say, all right, how would you interpret this set of data? And that data is what you found out about flights over the South Oceans. Oh, right, right, right. The, uh, the Southern Oceans, if you want to go look it up, it's, again, I ran into this by accident. It was not even me who, who first found it, where you take a flight in the Southern Hemisphere. I mean, in the Northern Hemisphere, you will see it too if the distance is great enough. But when a flight gets over water 200 miles or so, the latitude and longitude will drop off. And, and even though you might see the graphic on the screen, 
The plane they drop off, off, off of what? You're watching it on on some kind of a website. Oh, there's there the well, it's just the the GPS DOD system transmits to other uh, data to a lot of civilian stuff, so you can track your loved ones on like PlaneFinder.net or FlightAware24 okay. or Plane Tracker. There's a whole bunch of them out there. So you're but they all, to be they able all... to see where the plane is at any given time with any commercial flights. Right? Exactly. You should be able to see it no matter where it is because remember the GPS system is a global blanket coverage yeah, and there's, there's satellites. The, the plane should never, ever, ever drop off. But right. yet in the Southern Hemisphere, if you're looking at it, I know that they've been updated over the last couple of years and it's gotten better, but it doesn't matter. They, they still can't lie about the latitude and longitude. You look at those oceans, the Southern Atlantic, the Southern Pacific, and the Indian Ocean, and they're pretty much empty. There's, there's, even though we know there's supposedly planes over it. So why are the planes not being tracked? They they don't show it in the south, but they do show it in the north, is what you're saying. Well, they most of the planes in the north you will see, with the exception of planes that are flying between islands where the land radar can't track them anymore. Basically, I'm saying that there is no GPS system. The GPS system is the old Loran system, ground-based high high intensity radar, but even that has limits, which seems to be only about 200 miles if you don't have a repeater somewhere. I thought it was all satellites. Satellites? Yeah, oh, well, you mean I, the old Loran system? GPS. Oh, GPS is supposed to be satellites. That's what what I'm saying is that there is no blanket coverage for two reasons. One, because the, uh, the, the planes, um, they don't want to show the routes. Because the the routes would absolutely not make sense on a flat on a uh, on a globe model the the routes that they take and again you know watch all the look at the, look at all the weird connections that happen if you book flights from somewhere in Africa to somewhere in South America to somewhere in Australia, but the second part of that which I didn't really include in the clues was that again that's that's what we've been jumping on for the last year, which is people are coming back and say wait a minute how do we know there's satellites at all down there how do we know that everything isn't cable and ground based and it's just towers repeating each other how do in you know the southern, that satellites southern at all hemisphere you mean right i'm sorry what in the southern hemisphere or everywhere 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 meaning the loran system only works if you have t- places you can put towers in the northern hemisphere there's way more there's way the islands everything's packed in closer in fact most of the population is in the northern hemisphere but when right. you get to the outer ring there's huge chunks of ocean that have nothing in them. And, you know, rather than spend the money on, on ships and using them, you know, use military ships as repeaters, they decide, yeah, well, yeah. You know, let's, just, let's just wipe, take, take the, the planes and remove all the data and, and put them into approximated mode. It's, it's brilliant. It's, it's okay. a good plan, and it worked for a long, long time, but not anymore. Hmm. So, so what, what you're – I'm trying to separate observation from – interpreting theory sure and the option obs- because observation is just anybody can verify it and the in the observation that you're making about the southern hemisphere flights is number one during a flight across the south atlantic or south pacific yep there's virtually no gps data given for those flights is that right exactly yeah. there is no there is almost none the, the the latitude and longitude will change from numbers to uh, basically a question mark. In fact, they, that's interesting. Okay. They would say approximated or estimated because what they really mean is we have no idea where that plane is. Which okay. makes and if it was a satellite system, that would not be the case. No, right? there. Yeah, the satellite system. If the the GPS system, I mean, it stands for Global Positioning System. It doesn't stand for Partial Positioning System or, you know, Northern Hemisphere. It's the the satellites are supposedly everywhere. There should be no dead spots, okay. and we okay. see dead spots all over the place, especially in those in those big oceans in the south. And that should not be. The satellite's easy. The satellite doesn't make any difference where you are. Right. Doesn't matter if so there's, there's no islands there or not, and yet that's not the case. There's two possible there, interpretations of the, why there's no GPS in the southern hemisphere. One is is that, as you mentioned, there's a, a possibility that it's really not a satellite system; it's ground based, right? And there's not enough ground bases to make it work in the southern hemisphere, right? Except on the continents, and, and then the, the and the second one would be that if the flat Earth model is correct. The lines of longitude are too far apart. 
Yes. And showing um, GPS would show that immediately. Yeah, the, the routes would be so far out there. Again, you can look this up. You can try to book a flight anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere to somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere and see how many nonstop flights you can find. The routes That's a good, are the con- a good homework assignment for listeners, actually. Yeah, the, the connections will send you into places that we would never, that would double the distance in, in, in a lot of cases. I mean, there's some places where literally, it t- like from, from Africa to somewhere in Australia, you were, it was taking with connections somewhere like 40 plus hours for someone it, pushing, it should pushing, be easy pushing. to go nonstop straight along a line of latitude from one yeah. to the other. Yeah, just fly a freaking 13 hours, fly it across the ocean, do it. And and it never, I mean, yes, there's a couple flights that are out there that do do it. And I'm not saying that the flights aren't there, but I'm saying that when you try to book those flights, if you try to follow one of those flights, you'll never be able to prove the route because the, the data will drop off. And that's well, why so I made you're saying maybe the flight is not there. It may not. It may not be there. I mean, it may be, I mean, I know people have flown the flights. I have no doubt about that. But okay. well, here's the other trick they do, which I thought was very, very interesting. They will say it's a nonstop. This, this, you'll like this. They will say it's a nonstop, but they will take you to a fuel depot anyway. Because technically, from the airline standpoint, I did not know this until last year. If you land to get fuel, but nobody gets off or on the plane, it's not considered a stop. <laughs> it's well, like, What? That's, that's, that seriously counts? And, and yeah, and also, I mean, and if, people, you're, if you're flying across those uninhabited ocean stretches that you're talking about, yeah. there isn't any place to stop anyway. So, how do they do that? Well, they go slightly north and they find an island. There are fuel islands. In fact, there's like two or three, and I can't remember the name of them. They're funny names where they will actually stop. I, we know this because social media has changed the game where people have tweeted. It's like, I have no idea why we stopped at this island. I, okay. it, and they were on nonstop flights. But and they, what should keep coming up is that it takes them twice as long as it's supposed to. Yeah, it takes them way longer than it should. Now, does that mean you know that there are, are that you can't get some from somewhere in a decent amount of time? No, I'm saying that it in most cases we we still we're still trying to figure out. We know there's some scale issues with the UN flag map. We know there's some scale issues there. We don't know when you get out to the uh, the southern hemisphere. The distance is, there's something wrong with the map. We know this. We just can't, we're, we're still trying to nail down okay. exactly what it is. Yeah, that's a big point, because if somebody could make it almost in the correct time, anywhere yep. in the southern hemisphere, right. then the whole flat earth model is in question until that's solved. Well, part of it anyway, because you got to remember, if the route, here's the thing, uh, eventually some of these routes, and you can look on the flat earth map, have to, have to make these weird, these straight lines which cut across land. But even during the straight line, there's a couple hours. It's not. It's not like the map is 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 completely out of whack, but there's but there's still some issues where it, this, the plane still should arrive a, a couple hours later, and it doesn't. Which means, okay, does that mean the continent is smaller? Does that mean the ocean is smaller? We don't know. We, again, we're trying to work out the details there. Okay. Well, would you agree as kind of a wrap up point that the the purpose here is to get people to be first of all aware of the things that they know that are based on a belief that they just yeah. accept versus the things that they know that they have actually determined from their own experience or found out somehow. Yeah. And that once you know the body of knowledge that you have that's based on assumptions, start using your creativity to think, how would you prove whether those assumptions are true or not, rather than just changing your belief? I yeah. mean, because that's not what you're asking people to do. You're not saying drop one bl- blind belief for another. No. I think what you, I think what you're saying is start becoming conscious and checking things out, because then you know that a belief that was based on assumption could change to a belief based on actual knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, be be how open minded are you? You know, and and start with the most base. If you think you're open minded, let's, the, you know, this is your test. How start with the most basic thing there is. How do you know you're on a globe? How do you really know? You know, think think about that for a second. Do you know just because you've been told so many times of your life, or do you know, you know, or do you know because you know you saw a picture once and you bought yeah. it? Yeah. Well, so. and then you you can get deeper into that because the human being 
as you know a no, really a non-physical being living in a physical body for a while yeah. is looking out through a programmed intellectual mind a bunch of emotions based on experience and very limited uh, senses that only perceive a tiny bit of what's outside yeah. and so based on those limitations which everybody seems to have how do you actually know anything true yeah, unless you can Other test it for yourself. Able to say, I, this is what things look like to me. Yeah, uh, and again, I, I, I apologize for the people that are out there going, holy smokes, I'm not going to be able to sleep for a week. <laughs> I, 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 I completely hear you. It's, it's one of those things where, again, everybody who starts down this road, and I'm warning you in advance, if, you, if you're happy with your life and you don't want to mess with anything, by all means, you know, don't, don't look into this because that's your only defense. If you try to disprove this, if you try to go after it, you're, you're going to run into it because you're going to end up like like everybody else in the community. I think this is our first Lost Arts Radio episode of Twilight Zone uh, <laughs> Series 2. And the purpose of that series, which was great, and I thought Rod Serling did a great job, is just to get you to question. And, and really, that's supposed to be both the essence of scientific, real scientific exploration plus real spiritual discovery yeah. and neither one is based on well i guess i'll just believe this yeah. they're they're based on trying to find out what's real yeah. and that makes things a lot more interesting yeah. anyway so, yeah you you want to leave people with anything other than that to just remember from all of what you've said um the the only thing i want to leave them with is don't one don't take my word for it don't believe a single thing i've said you know just check it out for yourself and the community is vast now. It is so much bigger than it was even two years ago. Where, and I don't know why this awakening is happening the way it is, but just you know, forget about you know looking at my stuff. Just go into the easiest way is just go into YouTube, type in flat Earth, and don't set any filters and see what happens. And and it's amazing the amount of content that that's been produced. Some people have been exploring these things in other. Oh ways. yeah. What inspires people, it, it generates so much interest and curiosity that not only, I mean, we get so many people in the community that, that just created their very first YouTube channel, and now they've got well, tons of subscribers and making videos every week, and, and uh, yeah. it's, it's a massive community and very supportive of each other. I think, I think one of the main messages is to drop fear. You know, yeah. as far as I can tell, it's never helped anybody do anything. And if the Earth is the globe shape, it's going to be a globe shape even if you explore these other things. Yeah. I mean, if you look at other theories and find out they're nonsense, then the globe is still there. It's not dangerous. Yeah. It's just an exercise in stretching your mind. Yeah. So. Yeah, again, we'll... It's it's. I'm curious to see how this will progress. But the if if last week is any indicator, you know when the uh, the the NBA's best best point guard came out mm-hmm. during his podcast and said, "Oh yeah, by the way, theirs is flat." So it's it's just bizarre the way. It's, yeah, it's the, also going to be interesting to see the response to that. From all the media has descended upon media. him. I can't. You know, it's. It's interesting. The networks have avoided it for the most part for mainstream television, but all uh-huh. your sports stations have covered it. So we've okay. got we've gotten more mainstream media exposure in the last two weeks than we have in the previous two years. Yeah, so. because if they all want him, you know, admitted immediately into a psychiatric hospital, that's probably going to give more attention to your groups. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that'll happen though. I mean, he's won a championship, and yeah, he's, that's true. He's, he's in a good at position. the top of his game. So right. All right. Well, it's been a really fun experiment with you. I hope it gets people to think. And uh, hold on, and we'll say goodbye in the break here. Okay. Okay. There goes Mark Sargent. 